Hey everybody, Mr. J here. Today we are going to be going through the urinary system. And we've got a beautiful little bundle of spinach to start us off. So before we get started, I want you to think to yourself, if you were to describe one main function of the urinary system, what do you think that function would be? What do you think that would be? So the, most of the time people would say, oh, it's to basically detoxify, right? To take things out of our body that could like get in excess and hurt us. Well, that is true. But at the same time, this is not the major function of the urinary system. In fact, the urinary system exists to do that, to filter things out of the blood, but to also, we're gonna focus on this, reabsorb things back into the blood that could potentially be lost through the urine. So things like salts and glucose and water. Those are things you don't want to actually lose. So that's why the kidneys will help reabsorb those things before it gets passed out as urine. So today we'll talk about that talk about the functions, look at the kidneys. Uh, we'll look at the nephron, which is the functional unit of the kidney and how it actually filters that blood as it goes into the kidney. Um, we'll talk about the filtration rate and the filtrate and what it is, what's inside of it. And then we'll talk a little bit just about that nephron and how it goes through the process of producing urine, reabsorbing things and so forth. So first off, here's some good functions to write down. First off, it will filter salts and waste from the blood. What I like to think about this is the blood <clears throat> is basically all the stuff that's bathing your cells, okay? So every cell in your body requires a blood supply, 99% oh, of it, okay? So your blood's gonna be traveling to these cells to feed them. Well, if that blood has too much or too little of something, well, we need to either bring that stuff down if it's too much or bring that stuff back up if it's too little. And the main way we do that is through reabsorption so we've got maintaining those normal concentrations of stuff and reabsorption of those fluid and electrolytes. Um, it'll also regulate pH based on if it's reabsorbing or excreting like hydrogen ions or bicarbonate, those types of things. And then it also controls blood pressure and red blood cell production. We'll talk about the hormones involved in that process. So first off, here's an overview of what the urinary system looks like. Not, not many organs, honestly. We've got our kidneys. Okay, we've got our ureters, which is where the urine will travel from after being filtered out. The urine will travel down the ureters. It'll get to the urinary bladder and then it will be passed out through the urethra. Now we notice that it looks like there is a massive chunk of blood going to and from the kidneys. And that is absolutely true. Although the kidneys are only about like maybe a little bigger than your fists in the back. OK, even though they're only that big, they receive 20 percent of the blood pumped out from your heart. That's one fifth of your total blood going to two little fists in your back. OK, so these kidneys are really important to filter your blood that they get so much of your blood supply. OK, so <clears throat> here's some more functions specifically of the kidneys. So we'll talk about erythropoietin. Actually, I'll just point that out right now. If your red blood cells get too low, remember the red blood cells are the ones that carry oxygen um, to your cells for cell respiration. They also help carry carbon dioxide out to get out through your lungs to breathe out. Erythropoietin will be secreted if you ever drop that red blood cell count, or if the energy demands of your cells say, hey, we need more red blood cells to transport oxygen. So that's also called EPO, erythropoietin, which literally means red creation, red blood cell creation, okay? Second thing, if your blood pressure drops too much, renin will be secreted. Now, this one says it's an enzyme. That's technically true. Uh, I think of it more of as a hormone because it's going to be dumped into the bloodstream and then go act on some things to cascade an effect to raise your blood pressure. Uh, but just know that renin will increase your blood pressure. We'll talk about how probably later on. <clears throat> and then it also has some enzymes dealing with activating vitamin D into its active form, uh, calcitrol or calcitriol, which um, does a lot of different things. It's called the miracle vitamin for a reason. Um, and it helps promote calcium reabsorption or absorption and other things. Okay. So here's kidney structure. Uh, just a few anatomy terms. So here's the renal artery. Anytime you hear the word renal, it's going towards the kidneys um, or it's going to or from the kidneys. So renal is this renal artery. And then once it gets filtered, the blood that the kidney actually uses will be drained back towards the heart through the renal vein. Okay. Now, if we look at the kidney structure, what we'll see here is this outer layer that's light and then an inner layer that's a little dark, okay? Couple things I want you to note here. <clears throat> the outside is called the cortex. The inside is called the medulla. 
Within that structure, we're going to have the nephron. And this is the nephron over here on the right. This is the functional unit of the kidney. So when we're talking about how the blood is filtered, all the blood is going to go to these little tiny little machine units called the nephron. Okay, and that nephron is going to exist both in the cortex and the medulla. So the blood will be coming in here in the cortex and then it'll get filtered. The filtrate will actually dip down in the medulla, come back up and then keep going. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Okay, um, just a couple terms you may hear. Um, yeah, let me kind of point this out quick. So in these nephrons, so let's focus on this one right here. So what will happen is you're going to have what's called an afferent arterial. Okay, that came from the heart. Okay, went through the renal artery. Now it got small into the afferent arterial. That's going to go towards what's called this glomerulus. Glomerulus literally means ball of yarn because it looks like really like thread-like. Okay. Once it gets there, there's going to be a lot of slits in that glomerulus and those, all those little tiny capillaries. Remember the capillaries where like fluid can leak out and like bathe the cells, right? Well, in this case, there's a ton of those little windows that fluid can get out. So the plasma of the blood will actually leak out into that glomerulus, into that capsule. From there, some will travel into this tubule and that's now called the filtrate. And some will actually get reclaimed and just go back through the efferent arterial. Okay, so it can either get filtered out, the plasma gets filtered out into the little tubule, or it can be reclaimed and then just continue through the efferent arterial, which means going away from the glomerulus. Okay, and then from there, then we're going to focus on what happens to the filtrate. If it ends up staying in that tube, it's actually going to go through a collecting duct, eventually ending as urine. Okay, but if it goes through the tubule, it can also get reabsorbed. That means brought back into the blood by these peritubular capillaries. So notice how the, the tubule lines through this sort of web of capillaries. So what's going to happen is we're going to look at the tubule lining and the filtrate is going to be passing through the bottom. And the cells of the tubule can actually pump or move things from this side of the membrane to the outside. And that will go back into the bloodstream. So that's what I mean by reabsorbing, bringing things from that inside of the tubule, popping it out back into the capillaries to eventually go back through the uh, systemic circulation. So this is just a flow chart. If you like to think of it as a flow chart, uh, it's just coming to the afferent arterial, filtered through the glomerulus. It either <clears throat> goes to the efferent arterial just directly or that filtrate can get um, filtered out and then reabsorbed. So this is just a good picture of the nephron. A couple other uh, notes that you'll see. Um, so efferent arterial blood's coming in here. Afer or sorry, afferent arterial blood's coming in here, my bad. Efferent arterial is going away, okay? Now, once it filters out, here's the filtrate. It's going to go through a few different structures as it's passing through the tubule. This first part is called the proximal, close to the glomerulus, convoluted because it's all twisted. If you haven't know a convoluted person, they're all twisted up in their minds, right? Tubule. So this is the proximal convoluted tubule, otherwise known as the PCT. Once we get down to here, it's going to dip, remember, into that medulla. It's going to go really down far in the medulla of the kidney and then come back up. This is called the descending and ascending limb of Henle. Okay, descending and ascending limb or loop of Henle. Once we get here, this is the distal convoluted tubule, and then it's going to go to the collecting duct. And remember, if it stays in here, if the filtrate is still in here at this point, it's going to be excreted as urine, okay? <laughs> All righty, let's see here. So we're not going to go through the specifics of um, what's going to happen in the tubules, um, but I do want to kind of point out a couple uh, functional points. So when I say tubular fluid or filtrate, when the plasma is pushed out of the glomerulus through all those slits, now it's called filtrate. And at this point, this is just showing how we can move things from this inside back into the bloodstream, or perhaps we could bring things from the blood into the tubes and then excrete it out as urine. So think about this, for example, let's say um, you haven't eaten in a while. Okay, so maybe your blood glucose is dropping down a little bit. And that's not good because your brain's really hungry for glucose. So as this gets filtered out, there's going to be some glucose in your filtrate that got seeped out of those little windows. Well, your blood glucose is low. We want to get it back up, right? So what will happen is this will reabsorb, move glucose from inside the tubule back into the bloodstream. 
Okay. So just like I said at the beginning, I said that anything that's too low in the blood, the kidneys are going to try to bring it back up, reabsorb it. But what if there was way too much, for example, um, salt? Okay. So maybe your blood's too salty, too much salt. Well, in that case, salt's going to get filtered out. And instead of bringing it back in to the bloodstream, it's going to keep it in the fluid, in the tubular fluid, in the filtrate, because that will be excreted as urine. So this is a way we can also control getting more like sodium uh, salt out of our bodies through urine. Okay. So it's just a couple examples of that. Um, this is a really cool picture. Uh, when I say they have those little slits, these are called fenestra. Okay. They're little windows. And that allows for that plasma, the blood plasma to seep out with all of its electrolytes, fluids and that type of thing. All right. This is probably a pretty important uh, slide. Let's go here. So when I'm talking about the glomerulus, okay, we're going to be, again, filtering out some of the plasma. Some of it's going to be reclaimed. Now, the kidneys have a set point, okay? Remember homeostasis where you have like a set point of things and it needs to be the same constantly? Well, the kidneys have a set point of how much filtrate needs to be pushed out per minute, okay? I'll say that one more time. The kidneys as a whole need to filter a specific amount of filtrate per minute. If that number jumps up, it's going to urinate out more. If that number drops down, that's an issue as well. And the kidneys will have to um, accommodate for that. So <clears throat> what I want to have you remember is that filtration rate is about 120 milliliters per minute. Okay. That's your homeostatic value there. If it drops, if it drops, that usually means that your blood volume has also dropped. Well, if the blood volume drops, your blood pressure will likely drop. So what the kidneys will do in response is do something to increase that blood pressure. Specifically, we'll secrete renin, which will eventually reclaim um, more fluid. It'll vasoconstrict some of your blood vessels, so your blood pressure will go back up. So the kidneys want to stay at that 120 milliliters per minute, all right? Now, if you added this up, you would get to 180 liters of filtrate per day you are only made of about 40 liters of fluid. Are you peeing out 180 liters per day? No, you are not. That's because most of, 99% of the filtrate is actually brought back into the bloodstream. So only a very small percentage is uh, excreted in that urine, okay? <clears throat> so hopefully this is making sense so far. I'm going to skip through all of these words. Um, yeah. So this is what I was talking about when the filtration rate drops. If it drops, we're going to secrete renin from the kidneys, and it's going to go through this whole cascade of things where angiotensin, another uh, basically enzyme, is going to be cleaved, turn into angiotensin 2, which will constrict some arteries so that your blood pressure will increase. But then aldosterone will also be secreted, and aldosterone allows us to reabsorb salts, okay, salts at the distal convoluted tubule. Now, why would we want to reabsorb salts if our blood volume is low? Well, if we reabsorb salts, we know, you should remember this, that water really likes to follow salt. It's like attracted. It's like a moth to a light. Water likes to go towards salt. So think about this. If we have too low blood volume, we need to boost that up, right? So what do we do? We secrete aldosterone eventually through that system, okay? then the salts will be pumped back into the bloodstream. Well, if the salts are pumped back into the bloodstream, then the water will be brought back into the bloodstream. What would that do to your blood volume? Well, you're bringing stuff back into it. It will increase it. So that thus increases your blood pressure. So that's how that works. And this is that little, um, <clears throat> that cascade of things. So um, renin secreted by the kidneys. There's going to be a couple intermediates here that'll eventually turn into angiotensin two. It'll do a whole lot of things. Aldosterone will be secreted, and then it's going to help reabsorb salts at the distal convoluted tubule. And this is what it would look like. Okay. So when aldosterone acts on that distal convoluted tubule, this is the proximal, but imagine that this is the end, the last bit of the nephron. It will increase the amount of sodium chloride salt pumped back into the blood, which will allow water to follow it. Okay, that will increase your blood volume, which is really helpful. Uh, oh, here it is. There you go. <laughs> so this is what happens at the distal convoluted tubule. So sodium will get pumped back in, and then we'll also see water um, go back in as well. Um, and that also increases tubular secretion of potassium, because remember the sodium-potassium pump pumps things out and then potassium in. 
Uh, so potassium kind of comes this direction, interestingly. I don't really care that you know that for this class. Okay, so we just talked about how aldosterone, renin, the whole process helps to increase the reabsorption of sodium chloride, thus water. Um, another hormone that you've probably heard of before is vasopressin or ADH, antidiuretic hormone. That is secreted by the posterior pituitary, if you remember the endocrine system. And when ADH, antidiuretic hormone, think about it, antidiuretic, anti-peeing, right? Diuresis is urination. So if we are antidiuretic, what this guy does is it increases the ability for <clears throat> water to be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So basically if ADH is present, it'll increase all these holes in these membranes so that water can pass right back through into the bloodstream. So it's going to reabsorb water very, very well if ADH is secreted, okay? Thus increasing blood volume as well. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm really not gonna talk about um, urea and like other toxins. Just know that any sort of toxin that's built up in your blood will likely want to be uh, kept in that tubule so it'll be excreted out as urine, okay? Okay, uh, here's uh, the urinary bladder. So how do we get the urine out once we filter it all out? It comes down the ureter or the ureter. Um, it will combine to, if you want to see it uh, back here, <clears throat> into what's called a calyx. My goodness, got to go all the way back. So once all these tubules uh, do their filtering, now it's going to pass down through the collecting duct and eventually get to these calyces, the minor and major calyces, okay? And then that's going to pass through to the ureter. ureter. Now that's going to be urine. We can't reabsorb things once it's in the ureter. So then it will be stored, obviously, in the urinary bladder before we want to urinate it out. <clears throat> A couple of things to point out here. In order to urinate, what will happen is we've got the smooth muscle on the outside of the bladder called the detrusor muscle. Okay. This will contract when we begin urination. Okay. Or the micturition reflex where this guy will contract whereas the internal and external urethral sphincters will actually open up, especially this internal one. So you see the smooth muscle here, it'll relax, open up, and then urination will occur. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to go through for this video. If you have any questions, uh, please drop them in the comments below, and I appreciate you watching. Hopefully this was helpful. Oh, I wanted to talk about one more thing, sorry. Uh, blood pressure medication. So for just think about it for a second. All of the things I just mentioned about the reabsorption of stuff, so like, for example, <clears throat> aldosterone gets uh, sodium back into the bloodstream, water follows, it increases blood pressure, right? Well, think about if you have too high of blood pressure, which is a common occurrence in the American population, um, you have high blood pressure. Well, would you want aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone to increase or decrease? If they increased, more stuff would be brought back into the blood. What would that do to your blood pressure? Also increase it. What if you inhibited or blocked aldosterone and or ADH? Well, then more things will get staying in the tubule, so more fluid will go out. Therefore, your blood volume will drop. Therefore, your blood pressure will drop. <clears throat> so that's one reason why if you're on a blood pressure medication or you know somebody, they usually have to go to the bathroom pretty frequently. That's because they're peeing out a lot of their blood volume so that their blood volume decreases, so that their blood pressure decreases. So that's a cool little connection. Uh, once again, thank you for watching, and I hope this was helpful.